Just one, one. Thank you. Just keep them all off. There's no break. All right. So. What are you saying, really? Hold on. You're waiting all this time, sir? I mean, I don't know what you're doing. Who's he kidding, though, Drew, when we're hanging out here? Oh, that's good. Can you replay the video, please? Yes, sir. You can watch them all the time, and I'm trying to not be stuck in there, but I'm going. Yesterday we talked about momentum. Today we're going to continue talking about it with a new aspect. The derivative of momentum with respect to time is force. DP, DT would be force. Yes. All right, and we're going to use that today, actually. So yesterday we ended with two objects that collide with one another, stuck together, and then move together. Okay? We're starting with continuing momentum. Okay? I'm going to, but we have time at the end. I'm going to push you next week. I'm going to give you more promise to work on, so we might do it all one day. Now, yesterday we talked about P, and we said P equals MV. Again, it was a lowercase p for momentum. And it's equal to the mass times the velocity. We also said yesterday that the momentum in the beginning equals the momentum at the end. Now, keep in mind that whenever we do this stuff, the same thing goes for energy. So if we ever need another equation, we could always say KEI equals KEF. Kinetic energy beforehand equals kinetic energy afterward. Okay? But you can look at our uh, balance of energy. This is from yesterday. And this is also. Because yesterday for the homework, um, yeah. it just only asked for the velocity. Correct. So I was only just supposed to multiply. I didn't do like the whole, like, I just multiply. Depending on the problem, it might have been different. Is that bad? Yeah, I got a bunch of them here. Oh, my God. That's bad. Oh, my God. That's right, just pull that door. Guys, come on, focus. <laughs> now, you gotta watch the video graphs, Rich. I can't stop. We, did, we spent all day yesterday doing this. Momentum equals mass times velocity. Okay. Alright, now. In order to think about momentum, we want to also think about something called impulse. And that's what we're going to start with today. Okay, so we're going to take this on impulse. And here's what impulse is. Very simple example of impulse. If, Christian, can you catch well? Yeah. If Christian and I were going to toss this marker back and forth. And if he could imagine, Christian, imagine it's an egg. Okay, I didn't want to bring a lot of eggs. So imagine it's an egg. If I were to toss this to you, stand up. Show everybody how you catch it if it was an egg. Okay, not, not a marker, but an egg. But an egg. Okay. Yeah, so what did you do? Cushioned it. Yeah, cushioned it, right? He tucked it. He, he received it like this, as opposed to the to me. If I catch it, if I were to catch it to like that, what would happen to the egg? Okay, so impulse is simply that. Impulse is the idea of how long, impulse is the idea of how long you apply a force. So for example, when the egg hits my hand, I'm applying an equal and opposite force to stop its motion. If I go like this, I'm applying that force, that same force over a distance or a time period rather, of maybe like a second. So I have to apply a very light force, which is why it doesn't crack. As opposed to stopping this instantly, I have to apply a harder force. That's why it cracks. So we're going to go through the idea of today how force, time, and momentum are related. So with that said, let's start with F equals MA, and we're going to show the derivation. Newton's laws, guys. We're always going to start with Newton's laws here. So, we're going to derive this formula. Once we get the formula, you don't need to memorize the derivation. We're just showing where it comes from. Well, you'll see in a minute. Now, you can derive everything. Everything. What do they do in the process? They derive under test. Sometimes you're asked to derive it yourself. Okay. In calculus, especially in college, you're going to be asked to do a lot of derivations. Damn. Uh, just different rules, equations, all stuff. All right, now. 
Who can tell me? What is acceleration the rate of change of? Velocity. Velocity. Very good, Christian. Again, acceleration is really delta V over delta T. Remember, it's the change in velocity over time. One of your formulas that was on your midterm. Now, if I replace A with that, let's go ahead and do so. F equals M delta V over delta T. Now, multiply both sides by delta T. Cancel, cancel. We get F delta T equals M delta V. Again, we're starting with MA. Replace A with delta V over delta T. Multiply both sides by delta T. My voice is gone, guys. It happens every week. You know that. So here, at this last line, we have to think about what delta means. So... <laughs> that part is fine. And then this really is M V F minus M V I. Well, this is just momentum. M V, right? This is the momentum at the end. This is the momentum at the beginning. And this is just force times whatever the time period is. Again, here, this is your momentum at the end. This is the momentum at the beginning. Okay? And again, F is the force you apply, the force applied over a time period. So this is where the egg example comes into play. So if it's over a time period, it's the momentum at n. Over meaning applied. Okay, guys. Like relation to. You're right. Absolutely right. The word over you think about divided by, right? Over. But this means you're applying a force during a time period. If you want to use the word during, you get instead of over to get rid of them, misconstrued. Okay? okay? During a time period. So. The idea is this. I tossed the egg to Christian. I gave him some initial velocity. Okay, that was where the momentum came from in the beginning. Again, I tossed the egg. I gave him initial velocity, so it's got momentum. At the end, what does he do? Doesn't he stop the egg from moving? So does it have any momentum at the end? So for the egg example, this would have dropped off. Again, this would have dropped off for the egg example because the velocity at the end is zero. Well, you know what? If we know the velocity I threw it at, if we know the mass of the egg, and we're able to figure out how long it takes him to actually catch the egg or to receive the egg, we can find the force that he applies on the egg. As opposed to me catching the egg in like, I don't know, 0.1 seconds and a much higher force. Okay, again, if he caught the egg over a time period of two seconds, it's a lower force because his time period went up. If I caught the egg in a very small time period, my force must be really high. Again, as one of these goes up, the other goes down. So the idea here is, think about examples in real life. Have you ever jumped off of something that is maybe three or four feet off the ground? Yeah. Yeah. Do you jump and land like this? No. Did you ever do that? Wouldn't that hurt a lot? Yeah. 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 It hurt your yeah. knees a lot, right? Yeah. And then you get that feeling on, your, on the bottom of your feet. Yeah. And it hurts you? Yeah. Like, yeah. 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 Roll. How come, guys? You are applying an equal and opposite force to your weight over a quick time period, as opposed to when you fall like that. How long was the time period there? It was maybe like two seconds, one and a half seconds. So my time period went up when I buckled my knees like this. Thus, the force went down. That's why it feels better when you drop like that, as opposed to just falling and landing with flat or straight legs or like legs. Same thing with lifting. Yes, what do you mean? You Give an example. Your, you gotta bend your knees when you want to lift up the heavy. Okay, well that's more for your back actually. Because if you don't bend your knees, you lift like this, you strain your lower back muscles when you lift up like that. Oh, nothing. So just, that's, that's more of... Health issues. Yeah. <laughs> more health issues. Because the time period is the same. Whether I lift it up like this, or I lift it up like this, it's the same time period, right? Yeah. Doesn't have any change. See how you split it up, over there. Can you, can you do the sure, sure, sure. But TF minus TI would just be whatever the time is at the end minus zero always. What's the time at the beginning always? Zero. We always say everything starts from zero. So delta T just means the time duration, the time period. Right? Okay. Questions so far? I want to get to an example. 
All right, let's take a look at a cool example here. So if we have... That's the equation. That's an actual problem. So that's the equation we're using. The one up top right here, really. F delta T equals M delta V. What? Okay, here it is. Okay. So let's say we have a tennis player. Please write this. For a tennis player... A tennis ball may leave the racket. For a tennis player, a tennis ball may leave the racket on a serve with a velocity 55. Meters per second, guys. Why are we talking? Come on. You got it right, please. 55 meters per second, which is about 120 miles an hour, in case you're wondering. We're going to use meters per second, but that's the speed that we're used to. If the ball, or if the tennis ball, has a mass of... 0.06 kgs, which is about 60 grams. Okay, that makes sense. Think whenever you think about a gram, think about like a sugar cube. That's about the weight of a gram. So we're talking about about 60 of them. Tennis ball. Okay, so think about what a tennis ball weighs. So we're looking at a very small one. Yes. Okay. You could also think about paper clips as grams. Paper clips. You always conceive them as grams. Okay. So we're talking about 60 grams here, or 0.06 kilograms. And it is in contact with the racket for four milliseconds. Four milliseconds. Four. Two. Where's two All right. Find the average force. Find the average force of the racket on the ball. Six. Seven. Question is: Find the average force. How do you abbreviate milliseconds? MS. Do we what? Trying to find it. Well, you actually know the admission. I'm sure the final is whatever you need to wrap it with. So ball gets tossed out. I'm going to explain that because that's a really confusing part here. So All right. But it's because it's not moving horizontally. Because it's not moving horizontally. So we're looking at that speed horizontally. We're not worried about the vertical direction. Now, the only way you can do this problem is by thinking about it beforehand. Because it's a little confusing if you don't go through the process. So here's what we have going on. Imagine, if you will, a person hits a tennis ball. For them to hit the tennis ball, the tennis ball has to accelerate at some point. Because the ball is in the air, and the person just simply takes the ball, tosses it up. So it's got a little bit of vertical velocity, but it's not moving that way. And then suddenly they come through and smack the ball. So they must accelerate it horizontally. Okay? So in the horizontal direction, when I toss a ball straight up, it has no velocity in the horizontal. Because I'm tossing it straight upward. So it has a vertical velocity component, but again, the person is hitting with a racket in the horizontal direction. So we could say that the velocity is zero to start. Even though you tossed it up, the ball is not really moving in this direction. And that's the direction that the force is being applied. So that's the direction that we care about the velocity. So now we want to say, OK, well, if it starts with zero velocity, and somehow it attains a velocity of 120 miles an hour, or what we see as 55 meters per second, it must have accelerated at some point. Okay, so this automatically tells us we will have a force applied. When there's acceleration, there's got to be a force. So in this problem, it's sensible to think, what is the force? 
Remember, it started at zero velocity because the ball is just kind of sitting up there in the air. Then the person hits it, and after six milliseconds, it's already attained a speed of 55 meters per second. How did that happen? Some force must have applied. Again, why did the force get applied? Because the ball was accelerated. That's why it had a force. Now, using our last equation, all we're looking for is solving for the force. So let's go ahead and do that. We start. Our time period was 6 milliseconds. Our final velocity was, sorry, 4, thank you, Karen. Our final velocity was 55 meters per second. Um, our initial velocity is 0, and the mass of the ball is 0.06 kg. And we are trying to find So the only thing we got to do here is look at our conversions. All we got to do is convert milliseconds. Because kilograms are fine, meters per second are fine. So think about it, guys. Would 4,000 make sense? Divide by 1,000. Milli means 1,000 or 1,000, as opposed to kilo, which means 1,000. Now, because it's a millisecond, we have to divide by 1,000. And if you think about it, please use your logic. If you multiply by 1,000, it would have meant that the contact between the racket and the ball was 4,000 seconds. Think logically. Does the ball contact the racket for 4,000 seconds? No. So when you multiply by 1,000 and get that answer, say to yourself, this doesn't make sense. I'm doing something wrong. So divide by 1,000. Okay, so there is my time period. That's it? We've got a time period of 004. Again, all we've done is convert. The problem is asking us to figure out what is that force that's being applied here. So, if we're looking for the force here, we have to think about how do we solve our equation for force? Divide by T. Very good, sir. So, we've got F delta T equals M delta V. We know that the VI is 0. We know that the VF is 55. We can plug in M. We can plug in delta T and solve. So, here, that's all divided by delta T. Okay, again, we divide by delta T to solve for S. Thank you. Newtons. Now, again, force equals M VF minus VI all over delta T. Again. Please notice what I'm doing. I'm breaking up the delta V because we have two velocities there. And delta T it's just a time here, and I have to break it up. Okay. You could just simply put 55 there, that's fine. Yep. I'm just showing that you have an initial and you have a final velocity. Whereas time, it's not really like an initial time and a final time, it's more of just a time period that it's in contact for. Okay? For T? Not really. Okay? But again, I want you to think about duration or time period. Delta is going to be constantly used in calculus, so I'm trying to. Use more and more here. So you got 0 0.06 kg. We got 55 meters per second minus zero meters per second all over oops, 0 0.004 seconds. And look at your units, everybody. You're going to have kg m over s squared, which is a newton. Okay, you're going to have kg times meter over second squared now two seconds in denominators, which is a newton. KGM over S squared is newton. Julian. Oh, okay. Yes, what do you got? 825 newtons. 825 newtons. Agreed? That's a lot yeah. of us. Yeah. Sounds good to me. Now, let's think about this using logic. An average person weighs about 600 newtons, in case you're wondering. To lift somebody off the ground, you have to lift 600 newtons. So these people that play tennis, are hitting with more force than they would even use to lift a person. So think about how strong a tennis player is. Let's put those okay. They're applying a force of 800 newtons. That's why they are professionals. Yes. Okay. One other thing that I noticed, and I read a little comment about this. It's actually, it's actually more accurate 
to use equations in this time, in this uh, kind of an example, than it is to actually try and film it and get the actual force. They use high-speed cameras and stuff, but this is actually more accurate than doing that, than using these formulas. Again, it's one application of where you might see it. This is how they can tell you how hard a tennis player hits a ball. All right. Uh, sorry. Do you see how you broke it up before with MVS minus MVI? Sure, because I'm, I'd be like factoring at the end, right? To the end there on the outside? It wouldn't really matter right now because you're looking at force, and if it was negative, it would just be the equal opposite reaction. But tra traditionally, yeah. Mr. Howell, did you close school? I do. I I don't drink coffee or anything like that, so I drink tea as an alternative. Okay. So he has a lot of caffeine in coffee. Well, it doesn't have caffeine, it's white tea. Lost one then. White tea. Black tea, white tea. I don't drink coffee, but that's just a sad thing. I didn't say it. I didn't say it. <laughs> I'll let it go. <laughs> All right. All right, so I want to do the problem we talked about, where if a person jumps, if a person jumps and lands, please listen, guys. If a person jumps and lands with their knees and they bend them, as opposed to holding them locked, let's figure out the math behind it now. Okay? So we'll see again what the difference is in the force that the person feels on their legs as opposed to, you know, like this or this. I'll do it. How are we going to measure it, though? <laughs> See, who gets injured more. <laughs> yeah. You know how we could measure it, actually? We could try this maybe next week. If I can, I'll go out and buy a scale. If you get a scale and you're able to... Jump up and You're able to, we have to do two things. We have to find a surface to jump off of, like the table, okay? Jump off the table and land on the scale without breaking the scale, which is going to be the hard part, really. Okay, one person that jumps off does this as they go down. The other person just lands like this. You need to have a camera on the scale that's a high-speed camera so you can see how the digital scale you fluctuates. Have scale. Okay? So you want to look for that highest, like you'll see that impulse shoot up. So you see the scale. So say you weigh, say you weigh 150 pounds and you jump off a table and land on a scale. Okay? It's not going to read 150. It's going to spike up. It's going to spike up to like 500 or something. And then once you settle yourself, it'll go back down to 150. So what we have to look for is that spike. So you need a high-speed camera to see the actual time. No, they said we're going to do an experiment. We're going to prove it in a minute how to do it with a with, uh, man. I'm going to try. I'll see if I can get a scale so we can. One that doesn't break. The thing is, it's got to be the same person, you know. You can't have two different jumps. Because then they're way with right? right? I want to control. What are you doing out here? All right. If a person that is 70 kilograms, can we draw a girl this time? Can you add a little dress? No. No. How do you draw a girl? A triangle? A triangle. A square. A beta. <laughs> no, the oh, right here. 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 Draw a 70 kg. Imagine the person jumps three meters, which is almost nine feet. Okay, it's a pretty long jump. So you're talking about jumping out of like uh, the first story in a building. Okay, ten feet. Ten feet is traditionally one story. Then. Stories. So we're looking at. Don't you have to like throw? Oh wow! That was 2.2. You know? You convert it. 70 times 2.2? Uh, you're going to multiply by 2.2. Which is still 160 something, I think. 
That's right. It's a radio person, man. He's. So, we want to do. We want to do two things here, okay? We want to calculate the impulse that the person experiences, and then the force that the person experiences for either jumping with their legs straight or jumping with their legs where they bend them. Okay? Again, either the person bends their legs or the person jumps and lands like this. So we have to go ahead, and the book doesn't do this, but I want to do this. We have to go ahead and make an assumption here. Okay? They have to think logically for a second. So, if, if a person were to jump and land flat footed like this, what would you say delta t would be when they hit the ground? It'd be smaller. Smaller than the other one, right? Okay, do we agree? Delta Now, smaller than the other one. Delta By what kind of a factor would you say? How much smaller would it be? Guys. Five seconds for the person bending their knee, you're saying? Five seconds? The person landing flat footed, what would you say their time would be? Two seconds? Yeah, you think so? I think less than that. I think like one or less, actually. If the person just drops and lands like that, what an impact time? It happens real fast. Okay, I'm going to say a half a second. So. Okay, I heard a lot of good suggestions. We'll compromise. I heard one second, two seconds, or milliseconds. Let's say a half a second. Okay, if a person bends their legs now, I heard five seconds. Okay, you can see that. But again, guys, remember, it's the time it takes, watch me, when you land to go down, and that's it, not the time back up. Okay, only down. It's like two and a half. One and a half, two, three, in that range somewhere? All right, so let's, you know what, let's say two seconds. Okay? So two point zero seconds. Now, in order to do this, what else must we know about this problem? We got the, we got the mass, gravity, velocity, good. We need all these things, so let's go ahead and do this. So, let's use our energy from last chapter to find the velocity of the person at the end. It's very easy. P at the top equals K at the bottom. Again, remember, last chapter, at the top of this cliff or the top of this jump, the girl has three meters of height, which means she has potential energy and height. At the bottom, she has no height. Therefore, she has all velocity at the bottom. Okay? So again, start labeling, please. PE up here, and KE exists out here. Delta T for the, these ones? We're just making, that was the discussion. We're just like guessing. Elizabeth, explain that. Okay, define VF. Again, please, everybody, you got to think with the end in mind here. The goal here, come on, the goal here is this problem. Remember, we have to do F delta T equals M delta V. Guys, stop. We're trying to find F. We know delta T for both cases. We know the mass. We need to find the velocity. So to find the velocity, we have to use energy. You have to think again, go through like that loop. You try to get to here. To get to here, you need this. To get this, you need energy. Okay? How are we supposed to know to get that? We need energy. How else are you going to get it? You can use projectile motion. You could say it's a free fall. You could say VF equals VI plus AT. You don't have T. You could say VF squared equals VI squared like, plus 2AX. I'm saying, how in your mind did you make the connection that you, you don't need have energy? energy? Okay, I need final velocity. The only way to find a final velocity of any free fall is either energy or projectile motion. I chose energy because it's easy. You could use projectile motion also. This is where chapter one and in the last chapter we did all come into play. Remember, people, we are looking for the final velocity. There is no initial velocity. Initial velocity is zero. The person falls. Again, guys, just start with your energy formula. In the beginning, there's potential. At the end, there is kinetic. 
So last chapter we said P E in the beginning he was K at the end. P is M G H. K is one F M V squared. M's drop off. M's cancel on both sides. You see the one half here. How to get rid of one half? Multiply by two. The two and the one half cancel here. The two goes over here. You still have v squared. How do you get rid of the square? Take the square root. Square root of 2gh. Same answer we got last chapter. Whenever we derive this, whenever you find the final velocity of an object that falls off a cliff, it's always going to be that value. Radical 2gh. Okay? Again, we don't. We do the times. Can we just do that? We put the times down. So, you can always, if you remember, and I, I have this memorized, but I don't know if everybody does, you can memorize that. For an object that is free fall from a cliff, that's all it is for. You cannot have initial velocity. That's the key here. If you have initial velocity, that is not correct. Okay? All right. Now, using that VF, 7.7, .7, we go back up here and take a look. We're going to need to use our VF because we're going to have to use it right over here in this formula. We're going to have to put a VF here, and the VI is zero. So I'm going to use this formula now down at the bottom for two cases. Okay, so in this case, delta T was a half a second. In this case, delta T was two seconds. So the one on the left was the person that dropped straight down and then locked their legs. The one on the right is the person that kind of cushioned their fall. Now, in both cases, VF is 7.7, .7, VI is zero, and the mass was. What was mass? 670. Okay, again, both cases have the same information that we just wrote down there. In both scenarios, the person lands with a velocity of 7.7 .7 meters per second. He or she starts from rest, it's a free fall, and has a mass of 70. So, here is where solving analytically comes in handy. Okay? If we are trying to find the force, remember the formula here. There's our formula. If you want to solve for force, you can use the same thing for both sides. Divide by delta T. So we have, we're going to have a mass for the same person, it's got to be the same, 70. We have a velocity final of 7.7, .7. we have a velocity initial of 0, and the time period is what is changing, the time period. So use the circle formula here in both scenarios and just put a different delta t in both times. So the numerator on both sides will be identical. The numerator on both sides will be identical. Over here, we have f equals 70 times 7.7 .7 minus 0 all over delta t, which is 0.5. Here we have f, sorry, there's that. Here we have f equals 70 times 7.7 .7 minus 0 all over 2. Again, look at the only difference here. We're using the same formula for both equations here. We are solving analytically so that we can change a parameter. What parameter is that? Time. Time is a parameter that is now changing. Okay. What do we got for both? Yeah, we got 1,000. Go ahead, John. I got 1,070 for the first one. 1,070? 1,078. 1,078? Yeah, and the next one I got 269.5. Which happens to be a quarter of that if you do the math. Let's figure out why. No, no. I, the only reason I knew it was a quarter is this. That's why. This is, this is one half, right? That's a Newton, guys. Newton, not a Y. 
My hands look like double, sorry. I know. You're dividing by a half here. You're dividing by two over here. How much bigger is two than a half? Three quarters. What is it? Okay, the only one I heard right was four. It's four. Think about it. You got two dollars. You got two dollars and you got a fifty cent piece. How many fifty cent pieces makes two dollars? Four of them. Fifty cents, fifty cents, fifty cents, fifty cents. So you're dividing by a number that's four times bigger. So this number is a quarter of this number over here. Again, the only thing that's changed is your denominator. This number on the right, this is four times bigger than this is. So your answer on the right will be four times smaller. So when you buckle your legs, I'm sorry, when you hold them, when you buckle them and hold them shut, buckle, lock them, when you lock your legs, you're getting four more times force because the time period was four times that. If we had chosen point 0.1 instead of point 0.5, point 0.1 and 2 are 20 times apart. Again, if we had chosen point 0.1 here, this number would have dramatically increased by a factor of 5. This would have been around 5,000 on the left over here if we had chosen point 0.1 for this number. And that would have been 5,000 versus 200. So again, if you can go down slower as you fall, it's better. <laughs> Again, the slower you go as you fall, if you're able to hit the ground and cushion yourself nice and slow, you're, it's much better time period because you want a time period of like seven here. If you had a time period of like seven or ten, this number will go down by a lot more. It would be much less force on your legs. Okay? So whenever you're thinking about less impact or less impulse, you want to cushion something. As you catch it, you want to consider the fact that you're like cradling it in. Okay? And that's how if you ever see people with a baseball, you can do like a, a soft toss, you'll see them catch it with their hand like this. Okay? Somebody throws a ball far distance, you can catch it like that, it won't even hurt. If you catch it like this, it's gonna hurt. If you just open your hands and catch it, it's gonna hurt. A lot higher force. Alright. What I want you guys to do tonight for your work or for this weekend. On on Monday you all work. So you actually have three days. Don't forget that. On the Monday you'll work. On Tuesday, on Tuesday we'll go over the last homework you did last night and tonight's homework for this weekend. Second. Fourteen. Two fourteen. Numbers one and two. Okay, read. Read pages two hundred and two hundred one and two hundred two. Page 201, numbers 1 and 4. Right. Those are the problems you need to practice. You have two other problems from last night. Okay, four problems total. Last night's were mom change momentum and conservation. Okay. On Tuesday, we'll review this. On Wednesday, we'll start the next topic. Okay, still momentum for the next thing. On Thursday, thank you. Thursday. You guys work too much. Thank you.